Hello, um, thank you everyone. So I'm gonna try and give you a really quick overview. Uh, this should take about 15 minutes, so I will be cutting into your coffee break a bit. I will not be offended if you choose to get up and leave. Um, so I want to say, um, yeah, it's gonna be a really high level overview. Uh, really feel free to talk to me or any of the speakers offline afterwards if you have questions. And uh, I also just wanna note that I stole some of the speaker slides for bits and parts of this presentation. Um, so yeah, so we had sort of two parts of this uh, technical talks in the workshop. There are the theory ones and the human in the loop approaches. So I grouped these two together because they're both about, in some sense, what I call superhuman feedback. And I'm gonna go ahead and try and explain to you what that means. So I'll tell you about Amanda's talk on iterated amplification and debate first. So these are two different proposals that I both consider to fall under this uh, framework of superhuman feedback. And the claim, the motivating claim for this line of work is that human feedback is not scalable. So a single unaided human just isn't able to evaluate something as complex as a complete specification and design of a transit system for a large city. Um, and you can think of even more extreme examples like that. So for instance, well, I'll, I'll skip the for instance in the issue of time. Um, <laughs> and so what are we going to do if we want to build AI systems that understand our values and our preferences about these really complex things when we can't even give them feedback on, on our preferences in an easier direct way. And I think the answer is maybe somewhat obvious in, in hindsight is that we can try and get superhuman feedback by using AIs as helpers in the evaluation. Um, and you can also you know, think about using other humans as helpers, which is something that we do all the time right now. But if we want to really leverage AI as much as possible, we're going to want to use AIs to help inform our decision making, and in particular, the decision making that we make about the kind of feedback we give to AI systems when we're training them and telling them what kind of behavior we want them to give. Um, so there are two examples that Amanda mentioned in her talk. The first is debate, and the other is amplification. These are both recent papers from last year by the OpenAI AI safety team, and they're kind of, uh, finally elaborating some ideas that have been floating around and generating a lot of excitement, I would say, in the AI safety community for several years. So I'll give you a really short uh, description of what these are about. Debate basically says, I'm gonna have my AI systems hold a debate, and then I'm going to look at the arguments they make and see which ones I find compelling or convincing. And so that means that I don't need to figure out what the crucial considerations are for evaluating how good a proposed traffic system are by myself. The AIs will find those out and use them as weapons against each other in the debate. I probably shouldn't say weapons, but arguments is a more accurate word. Um, and so they're going to do all of the work of figuring out what is actually important for deciding this question. And then I can just make the judgment based on their uh, informative arguments. <clears throat> Amplification is putting a little bit more of the work on the human because this is asking the human to figure out sort of what the important questions are and decompose the question into these sub-problems. But then the AIs will figure out how to answer those problems and provide the relevant information to the human. So going back to this example of a traffic system, the human might ask, so what actually is it that makes a traffic system better than another? I have some ideas. There are things like uh, how cheap is it? How safe is it? Are there any externalities? And then you might even ask the AI systems, what are the things that I'm not thinking about that are important for evaluating how good a traffic system is? So you find your AI helpers, you ask them all these questions. If they are good at answering such questions, then you will have a lot of the information that you need in order to make an informed judgment. And you will be able to make much more broad judgments than you would be able to by yourself without the help of these AIs. And the, the hope is that this will allow us to scale uh, our training methods to things that are really vastly beyond human, human capabilities because we'll be able to evaluate them with the help of these AIs. So Jan Leica gave a talk outlining a research agenda that was put out by DeepMind uh, a couple months ago. Um, <clears throat> and this is sort of in a similar flavor, but it starts with what is called reward modeling. So reward modeling is this idea is, uh, let me just say that the goal of this research agenda was to solve all of the specification problems that we see, which is basically all of the problems about how do we tell the AI what we want it to do. And that isn't all of the safety problems, but it's a, it's a really big and important chunk of them. Um, so it's a very ambitious agenda. So the question is, how are we going to do this? And the answer that Jan has is, let's just encode our tasks in reward functions. So reward functions are usually what we use in reinforcement learning to tell our agents what we want them to do. The problem is that for a lot of complex real world, world tasks, or even ones that might seem simple to us, like do the dishes and don't do everything, anything else, like take over the world, uh, might be kind of hard to write down a reward function for. And the proposed solution is just to learn a reward function based on human feedback. 
<clears throat> and then you would use that learned reward function, what we call the reward model in this picture here, to train the agent. So it would be trying to optimize its reward according to that reward model. Now just like I described before with amplification, where the human can break down a problem and have the AI help by answering the subproblems, you can do a similar thing using reward modeling, and we call this recursive reward modeling. Now there are an, another contribution of this paper is that we point out a number of challenges that this approach might have, uh, and we also talk about how we might address them. But I'm just going to talk about one challenge that I think is one of the most important right now, which is this reward hacking challenge. So because the learned reward model is just a model and is not exactly the correct reward that we're actually hoping to optimize, there might be places where these models give very different numbers. And since the agent that we're training is optimizing for the learned reward model's impression of what the reward is, that can lead to undesirable outcomes, as you see here, where the red, which is the learned reward model, the reward assigned by that model, is really high, but at the same time, the real reward, which is the blue curve, is really low. And we're able to do these experiments in uh, video games where we know what the real reward is, but in the real world, we might not even have access to that ground truth reward and have a good way of detecting it. Um, but we do propose that humans should be evaluating and monitoring the behavior of the AI so that they can notice when something like this happens. So next, moving on, I'll tell you about Dylan's talk on Cooperative Inverse Reinforcement Learning, or CERL. So CERL is a paper from 2016, uh, and it's been around for a while and generated a lot of interest in the AI safety community as well, um, for a good reason, I think. And uh, so one of the things that Dylan wanted to talk about in this talk is sort of what is CERL actually about? Because I think there was a lot of misunderstanding about what the point of CERL is or how it's supposed to be used or what it's really telling us. Um, and there's this analogy with traditional reinforcement learning and Searle. And traditional reinforcement learning can be thought of as a definition for what it means for an AI system to be rational. And in more concretely, reinforcement learning says a system is rational if it obeys the expected utility hypothesis. And there's a lot of work in like economics and, and literature going back, you know, 50 plus years that sort of uh, gives reasons to believe that that's a good definition of rationality. Now Searle says what we don't, what we care about is not actually the rationality of the AI system by itself, we care about the joint rationality of the AI and human combined system. And those are the kinds of systems that we really should be analyzing because when we're training an AI, there's always a human in the loop providing the feedback about what we want from the system. So in particular, Searle says that the human and the robot are going to work together to optimize the human's reward function, but only the human knows what that is. So that means that the robot has to both try and do things that are good according to that reward function, but also needs to be trying to learn more about what the human actually wants while it's behaving. Um, there's also uh, a lot of other sort of insights that, and, and perspectives that Dylan shared with us. So one of the most interesting, I think, is this idea of viewing machine learning as programming via incentive. And the idea there is that we have made so much progress in machine learning largely because we figured out that we should, that it's very effective to get the behavior you want by providing incentives as we do in reinforcement learning. And arguably that's because that tells us that the agent should behave rationally and rules out a large class of behaviors that just don't make sense, like flailing around, uh, which doesn't accomplish any goal uh, or any you know, reasonable goal, except dancing. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, uh, I'll move on, but I thought that was really interesting and I really encourage you to talk to Dylan about his perspectives on this. Um, yeah, next we had Eric Drexler talking about the comprehensive AI services framework. So this is another thing that's kind of been floating around for a while, but uh, Eric has finally provided us with a 200 plus page write-up on it, which I also encourage you guys to look at. I think this is a really important idea to know about um, because it really challenges a lot of the assumptions that people are often using, even implicitly within the AI safety community. Um, and so a lot of what Eric is hoping to accomplish here, I think, is just to get us to change the way that we're thinking about AGI. And I'll just sort of go through a few of the most salient points of that for me. So one thing is that if you look at what people actually want in the real world out of AI systems, the claim that Eric makes is that people just want services. They want, like any other machine, they want something that accomplishes some task for them. And that really doesn't need to be an agent, and arguably it shouldn't even be an agent, or certainly not one that has these really long-term goals that lead it to try and shape uh, the entire future and uh, acquire all sorts of resources. Really what we want are AI services and those are going to be performing tasks that are resource-bounded and time-bounded. So really we sort of know what we want and that's 
to do this thing and then have the AI system be done and shut off and sort of await further instructions. Um, another point that he makes is that when we talk about the AI, this can be a very, give us a very misleading picture of what AI systems are actually going to look like in practice and do look like. Because systems that we build are usually modular and have a lot of different components that are doing different subtasks. And that's just a very different picture from having a single unified agent with a long-term goal. Um, Finally, uh, Eric claims that this is comprehensive, or at least the vision for this framework, which again, it's just a framework and a way of thinking about things, not a technical blueprint that we can go out and implement right away, um, is for this to be comprehensive. So anything that you wanted to do with an AGI system, Eric says you can do with comprehensive AI services. And I think that's a really uh, important idea to engage with. Um, and I just want to note that this is still not considered a complete solution for safety. It's really more of a way of approaching the uh, safety problems. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now. So now we had the uh, theoretical talks, as I, as I said. So Scott Garibrandt uh, was here to tell us about embedded agency. So Scott and Abram recently wrote a series of posts, uh, blog posts for Miri um, that talk about this that are really excellent. I think if you have heard of Miri and think they're interesting but don't really know what their research is supposed to be about or why they are interested in these problems, this is what you should read. This is really the best explanation I've seen for the motivation for their work. So the, the underlying issue that uh, Scott is pointing out is that reinforcement learning, which is how we often think, what we often think of as a definition for AI, is actually a leaky abstraction. It says that the agent and the environment live in these sort of separate worlds and they only communicate via a well-defined interface that we get to specify as the designers. Now, in the real world, that's not, that's not a good description of physical reality because the AI system and its environment are really all just part of physical reality. And that leads to a bunch of really interesting, deep, uh, technical, and even pseudo-philosophical questions that really break the ways that we're used to thinking about agency and thinking about artificial intelligence within the reinforcement learning framework. So in particular, they're grouped into these four categories. Um, and I guess I talked about not having well-defined input-output channels. Let me just give an example of what, what sort of thing we're talking about by that. When I look at the code of my reinforcement learning agent and I make a decision about what I'm going to do based on that code, for instance, I'm going to shut down the agent or I'm going to make another agent like it, but changing something about the design, that agent's code has just impacted its environment, which I'm a part of, in a way that totally circumvents its actions. So it wasn't an action taken by this code that made me choose to, to do these things. It was me looking directly at the code of the agent. And in reinforcement learning, we typically totally abstract that away and pretend that the code is just not a part of the real world. Um, so here's just a diagram that sort of shows how all of these different things that Miri have been talking about can sort of be viewed as part of this general problem and in terms of those categories I gave you. So next we had a talk by Vika about measuring side effects. Um, so side effects are basically disruptions to the environment that aren't necessary for accomplishing an agent's task. So an example is like, if you're moving a box, you don't need to break a vase that's in your way, usually, to get the box where it needs to go. You can step around the vase. On the other hand, you need to break some eggs to make an omelet. So that shouldn't really be considered a side effect, even though it's disrupting the environment. It's necessary for accomplishing the task. So one of the contributions of Vika's work here is to lay out some desiderata that we want for any measurement of side effects. And this is really interesting because we don't really know how to formalize what we mean by side effects. And I think any progress on what that would look like is really worth paying attention to. Um, in particular, I want to uh, uh, highlight this last desiderata, which is the offsetting incentive. And so the idea here is that if you just uh, do some naive way of telling the AI not to have side effects, it's actually going to try and correct for things that happen because it accomplished its task, even if the, it's not correcting for things that were necessary for accomplishing the task. So the example here is like, the AI reasons, well, you know, if I hadn't fetched your notebook from outside, then it would have gotten wet when it rained. So I need to make sure that your notebook gets wet so that I didn't have this side effect of making your notebook dry instead of wet. And that's something that we don't want, right? Um, so just briefly, I'll say uh, Vika defined this relative reachability criterion, which basically satisfies all of these desiderata if you set it up correctly, although there are still a lot of challenges in terms of making this practical, in terms of uh, how to compute it and so on. Um, I'll move on. 
<clears throat> so we then had Ramana talking about verification, security, and containment. So one thing that people think about when they think about AI safety is, let's just put the AI in a box and make sure it doesn't get out. That seems safe. Um, and a lot of people within the safety community, I think, have sort of poo-pooed this idea and said that, you know, that's not going to work. The AI is going to break out of the box. Um, but at the same time, I think everyone agrees that it's kind of worth having as an option for a fallback, or maybe just for while we're doing experiments for things that we don't really think are dangerous, but might be. Um, and so there's this goal of making a box that's really good and that actually will contain an AI, assuming that the AI doesn't find some really clever way to hack out of the box. And of course, um, the problem with doing this in a straightforward way is that the AI, if it is like, doing uh, consequentialist reasoning like uh, a reinforcement learning agent would have some incentives to try and get out of the box. And there's a, a proposal by Stuart Armstrong that sort of tries to fix these incentives and uh, does somewhat of a good job of that. And so what Ramana did in this, in this work that he presented is he actually verified these uh, parts of the design that Stuart says are going to make the box safer. And in general, Ramana's talk was about the potential to use these verification technologies in uh, machine learning and for safety purposes, which I think really hasn't been talked about uh, or explored that much, but is really important area. And this can both prevent like obvious bugs in the implementation that an AI could use to sort of uh, to, to break out or to do things that we don't intend it to do. Uh, like maybe you guys have seen this example with a Mario playing AI that can exploit some bug in the code of the video game to just jump immediately to the final level. Um, <clears throat> but it's also something that has a lot more potential going forward, I think, if we can figure out how to specify the sort of things that we want to be verified. So there has been a bit of work on that so far in terms of specifying, uh, sorry, verifying adversarial robustness, which is fairly easy to specify when you are only thinking about these very limited kinds of adversarial examples, uh, which are like norm balls around the, the, the inputs. More generally though, it seems like we do have a, a big issue with applying these techniques more broadly in terms of specifying what we actually want to verify. Um, but I think it's, it's a really interesting uh, avenue to be exploring as well. So finally, after all the talks, we had a debate, uh, which I moderated between Anna Salomon, Rohin Shah, and Peter Eckersley. And the topic was basically, will future AGI systems be optimizing a single long-term goal? So is Eric wrong and we're actually going to end up with you know, these super agenty, super intelligent, long-term optimizers, uh, whether we like it or not? And so we tried to make that more specific by saying, even if we sort of all agree that that's a bad thing, are there reasons it might happen anyways? And just to give you a really quick highlight of the debate, two reasons that were proposed of why that might happen anyway, anyways have to do with what are called inner optimizers. And then finally, uh, there might be economic incentives for these kinds of agents, arguably, because they might be more efficient at doing something like, <laughs> I've now been told to take my time, um, <laughs> doing something like maximizing profit on the stock market. That's something that's very easily encoded as a reinforcement learning objective. Um, and then Peter Eckersley also mentioned this idea that having a preference for respecting other agents' autonomy might actually be a way that you can do something that is meaningfully different from uh, optimization of a utility function as we usually think of it. And that's really it for my talk. So uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, talk to me afterwards if you want to know more.